there's this thing. Um, I was I was not going to do this. I really wasn't. I wasn't going to watch this movie. Um, I was not pleased with the the first version of it, and moreover, I was not a fan of either of the two movies from the same director that immediately preceded it. Um, and as my best friend Matt uh, has said so eloquently, shit doesn't get better when you add more shit to it. <laughs> so um, I was not one of the multitude of butthurt fanboys who demanded this Snyder Cut for some reason or another um, because, I, again, I had seen the previous two films and said, you're just going to get more of that. And, yeah, so I I, I was not going to, to go in for it. I just wasn't. Um, over spring break, I, I was down. I was visiting my girlfriend, visiting Rebecca. I don't know why I call her that because she's been on this show. So, you know, Rebecca, my girlfriend. Um, and she had to work the first two days I was there, so I had kind of the house to myself for a little bit, and she had HBO Max, and I, uh, I decided that I can't complain about something if I haven't seen it, that I, I have to, I have to see it for myself, so it took two days to finish, <laughs> and, um, and after kind of digesting what I had witnessed, I finally decided I need to come and talk about this. Uh, even though dozens of better critics than me, more respectable, more viewed, have given their two cents, I, I still feel like I need to come and say my piece on the subject because I don't see the major points that I see in this film being represented. People have made kind of blanket statements and talked about the obvious things, but I don't feel that anybody has gotten to the heart of the matter, in my personal opinion. So that's what I am going to do. I am going to talk about Zack Snyder's Justice League, the director's cut, whatever you want to fucking call it. Um, I'm going to say my piece, and hopefully we won't have to deal with this again until uh, God knows what. Um, so here we go. So the first thing we have to ask is, is this movie better than the 2017 version credited to Zack Snyder, but really ghost directed by Joss Whedon, hacked up and reassembled? So which one, which version is better? Is it the Snyder cut or is it the Whedon cut? And I think the obvious answer is yes. I, I must say that as a completed project and as a completed vision, the Snyder Cut is better. I don't think that's really much of a, of a surprise to anybody because in most instances, a director's cut is going to be better than the theatrical release in any situation because you get a, a closer vision of what the director wanted. Okay, so um, especially in this case where two different directors with two very different styles came in and, you know, just the details of all that are out there. I don't want to get into the ugliness of it. I'm just, I'm speaking strictly in terms of the movie itself. Yes, the, the story hangs together a lot better and feels like a natural continuation from the films that we had prior. Whereas the Whedon verse one was trying very hard to ignore those films ever existed. Not, not in a bad way, in my opinion. You know, I can understand why they did that, but, uh, but you know, because it shares that connection, I feel like it, it leads more naturally. It doesn't feel like you're coming out of nowhere. Um, Visually and directorially, there is a unified look and unified feel to it. It doesn't feel hacked to the bone and reassembled from parts from different movies like the, the 2017 or the 2017 version does. So that's good. Uh, a lot of critics have already mentioned this, and it, I think it's, it's important to mention since he is kind of at the heart of some of the controversy, not controversy, but some of the, the discourse around this movie 
Um, I, I do believe that it was a really smart move uh, to make Ray Fisher's cyborg kind of the emotional center of the film, to, to kind of make him the audience POV character. If nothing else, it kind of explains why Cyborg is here. You know, when, when they announced the lineup for this, it's like, this is a team that, you know, normally includes Green Lantern and or Hawkman or Hawkwoman in that, uh, that spot. So why Cyborg? And the, you know, the, uh, the explanation I heard was like, well, you know, a lot of people loved him from the Teen Titans cartoons that were popular, you know, so uh, more people are familiar with him than maybe, you know, they were back in my day. Okay, fair enough, but he's still kind of a second tier character compared to the Green Lantern or one of the Hawk people. But in this version of it, um, making him, again, kind of the audience POV character is a, is a good move. He's a character that if he did get his own movie, I don't even know what they do with his own movie. I don't know if he's ever had a solo series. He's always been part of a team, either the Justice League or the Teen Titans. I don't know how you would you do a cyborg standalone film. So they do his origins and his character growth and all that in this film, and it I think it works. It makes it a lot better um, as far as I'm concerned. I think it was a smart choice. I also have to say, in terms of the positives, uh, the Flash is nowhere near as annoying in this as he as he was in the Whedon cut. Uh, yeah, I just every word he said in the Whedon cut, I just wanted to punch him in the face. He's still annoying, but he's not as annoying. I can deal with him here. Um, so there there are some pluses to this. There are some good things going on in this movie. So I want to stress that because I'm about to spend an inordinate amount of time ripping this movie apart. Um, so as we enter into this section of the review, I have set some ground rules for myself. Uh, primarily, I am going to limit myself to two two references to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I am only going to compare elements of this movie to the Marvel Cinematic Universe twice. That's it. Okay? That's rule number one. Rule number two is I am I'm going to really quick go over the... Uh, oh, something else that was in the positives. I'm sorry. Something else uh, before we... I have to backtrack again. Um, something else in the positives. I, I must admit the, the nerd in me really loved all the stuff and the teasing of Darkseid and actually seeing Darkseid and setting him up as the the big, big bad going off, um, uh, you know, into you know, supposedly other sequels, which hopefully we'll never have to sit through. So, but seeing Darkseid in there was really cool and he was really ominous. It was good foreshadowing. Anyway, all right, so I, I had to do that. Now, back to what I was saying. Um, I want to breeze through the general stuff. All the other critics, Cinema Sins, um, uh, Pitch Meeting, uh, Honest Trailers, a lot of those sites and a lot of other critics have already pointed out the basics of this. The big problems, the ones that everyone knows, the, 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 the obnoxious length of it, the um, the tediousness of it, the uh, the fact that Zack Snyder is just in love with slow motion, which that is one of his one of his directorial uh, staples. But when one of your characters, the Flash, uh, uses his powers and they're symbolized by everything else moving in slow motion, it kind of negates the epicness of it when. The Flash's powers are mimicked by Lois Lane putting her coffee down, okay? So, yes, the obnoxious use of slow motion. Yeah, other people have really gone into a lot of this. I want to focus on the big things. I feel like, as I said at the beginning, that the big problems of this are not really being touched upon. And I really think we need to touch upon them to explain 
why this doesn't work. Why this just does not work. Why it hasn't worked from Man of Steel, from Batman v Superman to this. We've touched upon it, we've danced around it, but we've got to go into it. All right. I'm also going to say that you feel kind of bad um, ripping a director uh, when they suffered such a, an incredible personal tragedy in the midst of all of this. Um, but I, I'm, I, you can't let things just go either. So I'm, I'm, I feel bad for the guy but some things have got to be talked about, all right? So let's talk about, in my opinion, the three big problems with this movie and indeed the entire Snyderverse as a experiment. There are three things in this movie that symbolize the big problems we have here, okay? Number one, and this is something that people have picked on as one of those other little things, Wonder Woman's theme music. So if you haven't seen this, and I thought it was a joke when I first heard it, and then I watched it and I was like, no, they're freaking serious. Every time Wonder Woman does anything, it is accompanied by this, this, I don't even know what to call it. It's some kind of chant. It's some kind of, you know, <laughs> Every time she does anything, she farts and this <laughs> comes on. Now, I don't mean to um, belittle anybody's culture or be insulting to, you know, whichever culture this is supposed to clearly be uh, some kind of homage to. Um, and it would have worked once or twice, but every time she does anything in a four hour fucking movie, it becomes like a trigger. And a number of people have, you know, picked on this and have, you know, laughed at it, but it is indicative of a larger problem. And here is the larger problem that is at play. One of the things, I teach a directing class, and one of the things we talk about, because one of the things that was taught to me when I was, you know, taking my master's classes in directing, are how do you define an artist's style? How do you define what makes a piece of work specific to that artist. In other words, what makes a Zack Snyder film a Zack Snyder film? You know, he's a very distinctive visual director. He has a very clear visual style, uh, especially in terms of his comic book movies. But there is an underlining theme that runs through just about every piece of work I've ever seen of his. And that thing is quite simply ego. Zack Snyder's movies are some of the most egotistical films I've ever seen. I don't know if the man himself is a narcissist, but his movies certainly are. All of his movies have this belief that they are the most fucking epic thing you will ever see in your fucking life. And every bit of directing, every directorial choice is leading back to that central thesis. This film is fucking epic and I don't have to do any more work because I'm just epic just by existing. That's why we tie this back to Wonder Woman's theme music. That music would have been fine had you saved it for when she did something really important or really epic. But when she, but when it plays every time she does anything, what you're saying through music cues, through visual cues, is this is so fucking epic. It's so fucking important. And all of the music does that. All the visual cues do that. The, his incessant use of slow motion is there to do that. To say, look at how beautiful this is. Look at how artsy this is. Look at how amazing this is. And it doesn't earn a fucking 
bit of it. It has nothing, these characters have done nothing to justify this level of narcissism. I'm not a fan of the Lord of the Rings films, personally. They, they just never appealed to me, but I have a great respect for them just because of the, the level of filmmaking and commitment involved in making them. I bring that up because those movies are epic. I will say those films are epic. But what makes them epic is how they are made, but first of all, coming from the source material, but also how Peter Jackson chooses to film those. They're epic by the detail, and they're epic by our point of view characters, the hobbits, starting out in a small, quiet, comfortable place, very beautiful, and then slowly stepping out into this much larger world with thousands upon thousands of years of history and culture, all of them looking up at it much in the same way we, the audience, do. And therefore, everything that happens in this film feels bigger and feels epic and feels important. It earns its epicness. Justice League and the Zack Snyder filmography in general don't do that. Here it is. It's epic because it exists. And that pompacity, that ego, that narcissism runs through the entire thing, even up to and including the four-hour runtime. So that's one. That's one problem. Number two, Superman's black costume. Yes, it was one of the selling points in the trailer that when Superman makes his triumphant return, he is not wearing the classic blue and red costume. He is wearing all black. Once again, we see a problem that has taken root all the way back to Man of Steel and was very present in Batman v Superman that just has been the death nail for these movies. There is no fucking joy in this. No joy. This is one, of, it is four hours long and it is some of the most dour, depressing, unpleasant time you will have watching a movie where Space Jesus, a gorgeous Amazon, a guy who can run faster than light, and a billionaire who dresses up like a bat can be. I, I can't blame Zack Snyder completely for this. This has been, in my opinion, and I am a comic book fan, so I'm not coming at this from a novice standpoint. I read DC Comics. And part of the problem, I think, is not just from him, and we can blame it on the butthurt fanboys, the 40-year-olds like me, who sit around going, no, Superman has to be super serious because comic books aren't just for little kids, they're for adults like me. Therefore, anything happy is stupid and bad. They have their part in this too. But I think part of this problem goes all the way back to DC Comics having a severe identity crisis. You gotta remember, folks, DC, they were not just superhero comics. They were the first superhero comics. They took root back in the earliest possible time, the 30s, and the 20s and 30s and 40s is where these comics came to life. And first of all, sorry, old fanboys. Sorry about that, folks. But yes, they were originally written for children. You can whine and cry and beat your fists all you want, but they were originally written for children, and I would wager money, every one of you whining and crying about this got into these characters when you were children. I'm not saying that they don't tell great stories. I'm not saying that they can't tell bigger stories. I'm not saying that they can't tell uh, adult stories because they clearly can I still read comics but they were meant for children originally 
Moreover, these were stories that were meant to give hope. These came into prominence in the 30s during the Great Depression when people needed heroes. And then they came into more prominence during World War II. Okay, you want to take this out of, you know, you know, they were meant for kids. Here's a little fact for you. These were things that were shipped overseas to the guys going to war. Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Captain America, these comics were sent to the guys going to war to give them hope, to, to be fun, to give them something fun to look at. These characters are supposed to be fun. And there is no joy here. None. I want, okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna burn one of my MCU references. Here we go, you ready? Just prior to watching this movie, Rebecca and I binge watched WandaVision. This is a story that when you look at it as a whole, it is a story about trauma, about emotional trauma, about loss, about being unable to deal with so much bad stuff that you that you have a mental breakdown and revert to a fantasy world where you can be safe and protected. That is what it is about. But you know what? It's more fun to watch than this because they put it in an entertaining package. The other series, this is the part of the same reference, so I'm not burning through my second reference here. Falcon and the Winter Soldier is about systemic racism. It is about unethical medical testing. And yet, it's more fun to watch. You can do adult-driven stories, you can do a mature stories with these characters and make it still entertaining and appeal to younger audiences. It can be done. I want you to consider this fact. I, I, this fact came to me while I was watching this movie and it nearly broke my brain when I realized this. There, directorially, visually, I'm not talking in terms of theme or, um, or story or anything like that. I'm talking simply in the directorial language of the film, the visuals of the film. There is more color. There is more energy. There is more, I don't know how else to say it. I wish I could think of a better term because it doesn't fit the movie at all. Um, but there is more hope, visually. Visually, that's all I'm talking about. In Zack Snyder's Watchmen than there is in his Justice League. Fucking think about that. Watchmen. More color, energy, and optimism in fucking Watchmen than in Justice League. If your Watchmen movie is more fun to look at and prettier to look at than your fucking Justice League movie, son, you done fucked up. Hell, let's even go back further. Go to the Christopher Reeves Superman movie. The one that, or not, not movie, the TV show. The one where the first couple seasons were done in black and white. Those were done in black and white. They were less dreary and depressing than this fucking movie. And it all comes back to the simple fact Zack Snyder fundamentally on from the very roots of it does not get it. And I don't think DC gets it. DC, I mentioned this a minute ago, that DC has had an identity crisis because they started out as these fun, fluffy characters. In recent years, they have been trying very hard to take these characters who are goofy motherfuckers when you really get right down to it and trying to make them edgy and dark and every time it doesn't work it worked with batman a few times but now they've taken it so far in the other direction 
that he's gone from a guy fighting crime to a fucking psychopath in his own right. There's no distinction between him and his villains anymore. You can have... Look at... I mean, again, another comparison. Look at the Batman the Animated Series. Yes, darker, gothic in tone, still more fun, more enjoyable, more energetic, prettier to look at than this fucking movie. And you're looking at it for four fucking hours. So there's two. Number three, and I think this is this is a really important one. You know what we don't get in this superhero team-up movie? We do not get the triumphant shot of the team assembled. I'm gonna burn through my other Marvel comparison here. Every movie, these big movies, Movie Bob says this, and I agree with it. They have that shot. They have that moment that defines them. Right? Um, this isn't an MCU movie, so it doesn't count as part of, you know, Spider Man, the Sam Raimi Spider Man, the, the upside down kiss, the Matrix, you know, uh, Neo leaning back as the bullets shoot over him. Okay? So, what is the defining shot, the defining moment of the MCU? There has been a lot of them, but it is that moment in The Avengers when everybody is standing back to back, the camera is going around, and they're all looking up, and they're all tough. That great music is playing, that da, 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 da. It's playing, and they're all there, and, it, and it, it goes around the circle, and it comes in on a perfect group shot. The Avengers have assembled... And they are saying to the audience, isn't this awesome? This film doesn't have that. Oh, there are shots of the characters all together. Uh, the ones they like using in the trailer are ones where they're getting off of an elevator. Because, you know, that's, that's what I think when I think of the epic team-up of, you know, the modern equivalent of the Greek gods is when they have to get off the elevator. They they come close twice. They try twice. And they fail miserably both times. There's one shot in the, um, the rejiggered uh, battle scenes where uh, the team kind of has a splash page shot. It's a shot that directly rips off the Avengers shot from Age of Ultron at the very beginning where they're attacking Hydra and they all jump up on the air and they freeze kind of right there. It's directly ripping off that shot, but it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because one, they're all spread out. They're not shoulder to shoulder. They're not together. They're just sharing the same space. Uh, Batman is in the Batmobile, so he's not even physically present. He's represented, but he's not present. And Superman hasn't joined the team yet. So it doesn't work. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a splash page. It doesn't fucking come together. The, the shot we finally get of them all together at the very end of the fight, where they're all standing together and the camera's just panning and they're all standing there and they're basically going, yeah, yeah, we, we did that. That was a thing we just did. Yes, sir, Bob. Sure, stop that. Uh, yeah, it is. It is such a bizarre moment because, as I mentioned, narcissism and ego permeate this entire fucking movie. But when it comes to giving us the money shot, the shot of all these great heroes finally coming together and uniting, the best you can fucking do is just pan across them as they're like, uh, 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 yeah, yay. It looks less like the gathering of the greatest superheroes ever assembled and more like a group of nerds lining up for a costume contest at Comic-Con. It's... it's just, and, and again, this is the primary problem. But here's another example, not even a Marvel example. Um, look at the Arrowverse. I was a big fan of the Arrowverse for that whole franchise kind of collapsing on itself. But they would do team-ups every year, uh, right before the mid-season finales. 
And I think the best one for my money was Crisis on Earth X. That's when they did the crossover with Arrow, The Flash, Supergirl, and The Legends of Tomorrow. And in the final episode of that, we get two of those shots. We get one where they're all walking to go to that final battle. It's not as epic, but it's good because just because of it's made for TV, they're all closer together. There's more of them. So they're walking shoulder to shoulder, you know? Excuse me, shoulder to shoulder, digging stone. Um, you know, so they're united, and they're doing the tombstone walk, which is always cool. Um, and they do another one right before the battle, where they're all on the ship, and they're literally posed like they're taking a fucking family picture. You know, they're up on risers, people are up on different levels. It's a, it's, it's a not a great scene really, because it nobody stands like that naturally, but you forgive it because you're like. It's their, it's their class picture. It's the team up picture. They're all together. The family is united. None of that. None of that here. And that's, that's a problem. The coming together of these characters should be a joyous explosion of, of decades of, of waiting and wishing and imagining. And when it happens, it's, Right, we're just here. And it goes back to what I was saying. Zack Snyder does not get why these characters and why this situation is important. He wants the movie to be fucking epic, but he, he doesn't understand what makes it epic. Loud music and slow motion and a lot of CGI shots does not an epic make. There are a lot of other things you can go into. You can go into the fact that the, the final battle feels incredibly small and piddly when you consider it's a battle to save the world. Um, you can go into a thousand other nitpicks and drag downs about this movie, but I believe it's these three primary issues that make this film nigh unwatchable and there are people who want to reinstate the Snyder verse it's like really you want all of the life and color and joy sucked out of every fucking superhero are you Lex Luthor is that who's demanding this is it Lex Luthor cause if you're making if you want to make the world hate Superman buddy you, this is how you do it <laughs> so um, I sincerely hope that this is the last we hear of this. I can't say that I've enjoyed any of the DC movies from this experiment, but I will say that, you know, Aquaman is fun in a shit kind of way. Shazam had a lot of heart, even though I didn't quite enjoy it. But I feel like they're trying really hard to dig themselves out of these holes. Wonder Woman 84 was a 20-yard penalty back into the primordial lose, but, you know... Um, and I feel like the reemergence of this is just dragging them back down. Um, I guess I'll give this a final grade, and um, I'm really torn on it. I'm really, really torn on it. Um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna be a little nice. I shouldn't be nice. Um, I'm going to say I'm going to give this one a D minus. I'm giving this one a D minus. Um, the only reason I'm not giving it an F is just because I feel like a lot of the other things that I mentioned worked. Um, there's there's the residue of good ideas here. They just don't come to fruition. So there you have it. There is Zack Snyder's Justice League. And Lord help us, may we please finally be done with this. All right, so there you have it. That's my take. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, hopefully we'll talk about something a little bit more interesting next time. So until then, as always, drive safe, and I will see you at the movies.